Surat, I'm interested in your view about the financial stability, I mean, and financial materiality of what you were talking about. I, I still have an image of all those um, reporting standards that you put up on the slide, and GRI has encouraged people to think about materiality in a much broader way than financial materiality, but stakeholder impact, and then the accounting standards that are consolidating an approach uh, very much using financial um, materiality. In your research and your thinking, how is all this work helping think about financial stability or instability? Yeah, th thanks, Jackie. This is very timely and important question. I have shown in a couple of my papers that if there is a climate uh, risk in terms of physical risk, how does it affect the stability of the business? In one of my working papers, I've shown that more natural disasters happening in a state where firm has a headquarter have increased default risk, means less stability. So then it shows that the, the natural disasters have a material impact. Then how do that information is used by the financial institutions? We have shown in that research that if the firms are exposed to higher default risk in states where head, where uh, where the headquarters is located and more natural disaster happens, the financial institutions, in particular banks, when they give lending to those firms, they charge higher premium. So that's the cost for the businesses. So in the future, they have to then take some actions to address the climate issue, because if they don't address as a collectively, then those natural disasters are going to keep happening, increase the default risk and increase the cost of lend getting borrowing. I have also done research on extreme heat waves. So how extreme heat waves affect the financial performance of the companies. And we have found interesting result that shows that the extreme wave heat waves have a material impact. If the company's production or the plant or factory location is in an area which is exposed to extreme heat waves, those firms experience reduction in the firm profitability. And it is through the labor productivity laws uh, increased in the energy consumption and increase in the depreciation charges. So this research clearly shows that the, uh, the climate risk, physical risk, including natural disaster and heat waves have material impact on the stability of the business. Thank you, Surat. And I would imagine if you play that, that scenario out that you talked about with your research in the US in terms of then a higher cost of capital because of your risk, if you've just been through a natural disaster, your balance sheet and your P&L is probably the least able to respond to those additional costs and stay competitive. So uh, I think that gives us a lot of food for thought about how you then have to investigate your investment in resilience as well as just mitigating climate change itself. So thank you. Do you have a view on the question I'd ask Millie about the mandatory reporting and your prediction for how that will evolve here in Australia? I think mandatory reporting is a good step. Um, I appreciate that is happening because if our neighbours can have it, different countries in Asia can have it, different countries in Europe can have it. Uh, in Australia, from where we belong, it's our land, we should have the mandatory reporting. And we have experience in 2019, I think it was December, where one day in Wollongong, we experienced the sky was completely dark. It was because of the bushfire. And, and that is because of the, uh, we are not taking adequate actions to tackle climate issues as companies, as investors, and as a collective stakeholders in the community. So I take it as a very positive step. And and I appreciate the Treasury taking the lead on that and consulting with the wider stakeholders. And I also appreciate the staggered approach where the mandatory reporting will start with the larger firms and, um, and then it will move on to the medium scaled firms and then it will go to the smaller firms. And by 27, 2027, 2028 period, we will have uh, much of the internal capabilities developed, lessons learned, and then we will see um, a brighter future. Sirat, do you have a view on the demographic question that the person in the chat has asked? Yeah, definitely. So demographics, I think uh, it requires further research to look at the sustainable funds who is investing. But looking at my research on on gender and uh, age in particular. So I do see uh, female uh, 
directors when it comes to companies they take more initiatives when it comes to the sustainable uh, future research in journal of corporate finance which i have read have uh, shown that more female sitting on the board can contribute towards the transition from fossil fuel towards renewable energy so taking that i do see uh, that demographic playing a crucial role in achieving the sustainability like female uh, demographics and i think we should promote those females to really come up front and uh, join the hands with other like males to to push that uh, change together so so i think it leads towards the inclusive culture as well and i do see the young people because they are more exposed to the education they are receiving uh, mm. on the sustainability and um, and and more engagement with the with the artificial intelligence the internet so they have more exposure that is happening uh, just recently and they are developing their beliefs in that environment their attitude in that environment whereas the older people they can also be part of the change but i think it require a change in their attitude and perception which requires some incentives and push to to make that happen Sirat, I'm interested in your view because you did raise that in your three choices about you could move to just being excluding certain sectors. Uh, your view on that question that's come up in the chat about excluding petroleum and some mining? Um, first of all, I would like to support what Professor Billy just mentioned. A trans just transition is needed where we take care of everyone involved in that transition including the employees, the business, and all stakeholders. So I do see exclusion is a good starting point, uh, but it's not the optimal solution. Because as I mentioned in my talk, that if you don't give financing to the, to the companies involved in this business, then someone else is going to give money. So they're still having that business going on. But in the long run, the climate is going to affect those businesses, but in the short run, they're still there. So what I see more important is the ESG integration and impact investing. We need to move towards those uh, steps. In ESG investing, there is, a, there is an approach the investors can adopt is value driver adjustment where we look at what are the important and material issues a particular industry is facing. And then you look at how your company that you want to invest in is performing also on those issues. And then you see whether the company have a competitive advantage or competitive disadvantage. Based on that analysis, you can then uh, adjust the value drivers like the profit margin, the sales, the cost of capital. And then you can give a value that you can trade upon. And, and if you decide to invest in a company that have competitive disadvantage, you have an, you have an, you have an option of engagement. And if you have a large large yeah. investor, like uh, Mark Cannon Brook did for AGL, if you're an investor like that, you stay with the company and drive a change. So uh, I like that approach. But starting point exclusion gave serves a, base, a starting point, but we need to move on to integration and impact investing. We've got um, three minutes to go. And what I'd like each of you to wrap up on is what you think the opportunities are for skill development. And if you were really promoting what skills leaders should be taking for this space. So a bit of a plug for sustainable finance skills. Thank you. Sirat, your view on skills for the future? Uh, if you think about a world prior to 2015, uh, there used to be a time where financial risk used to be very important and, and the most important. But if you look at the global risk report that I shared, post-2015, the social and environmental risk have become important. So this tells us a story that anyone who have done education before 2015 might not have studied sustainable, including social and environmental risk, because education, the universities were less focused there because the demand was not there. The demand was financial training when it comes to the financial graduates. But post 2015, Sustainable Development Goals Paris Agreement, we are seeing more and more disasters happening. The climate risk is increasing. So now if someone have received education before that time and now working in the industry, need to uh, get up to the social and environmental risk. And what are the options available? The options are do some micro credentials, get back to the universities, do uh, graduate certificates like University of Wollongong offers uh, graduate certificate in applied 
uh, finance and we do have a subject on socially responsible finance. So the options like that are available to the existing professionals and they can join the professional associations, do like CFA, ESG specialization course, or CFI, Corporate Financial Institute, they have this ESG specialization course, and they can join the networks, like the Global Impact Investing Network, uh, the UN Principle of Res for Responsible Investment, to get involved in the training and continuous professional development. So, so these are the options with existing professionals. For new entrants, they are lucky. They are receiving the trainings at universities like University of Wollongong, and we hope that they will be better prepared for the future.